Good morning, church. It is a joy to be back with you. I watched worship online from bed a little bit last week. Uh, that was nice. Uh, I think we should do a PJ party at the church one of these days. <laughs> it has been a, a busy weekend as the community has lots going on. I know the symphony is tonight. Uh, Art fair, summer fest is happening up at MSUB. Uh, we had Pride yesterday, which was just great. Uh, Rainbow Coffee House had Queer Prom, a drag show, you name it. We walked in the parade yesterday morning. Um, and again, just amazing to see uh, how people are coming together in this community to so support people and in inclusion in all kinds of ways. And so today as we uh, enter into worship, I just want to acknowledge the heavy weight um, that may be on your hearts and minds after the Supreme Court ruling uh, this week. Um, right? It just feels like we can just keep taking as many hits as, as possible and we kind of just are putting those away in different spaces. And so um, throughout worship today, if, if you just need to sit there and dwell with those, those thoughts and those feelings, I invite you to do so. Uh, find a place of rest here. Um, so our announcement video is a little longer today, um, so let's just uh, see what's going on in the life of our church and community. At Grace United Methodist Church, we appreciate all the ways that our members contribute towards building a strong community through ministry. Here's a look at some of the ways you can help through your time and involvement. Join us in the Fellowship Hall after worship today for ice cream Sundays to celebrate Pastor Sam's commissioning as a provisional elder in the Mountain Sky Conference. Thanks to a generous grant from the Mountain Sky Conference of the United Methodist Church Creation Justice Task Force, we have replaced the light fixtures in the fireside room with new LED energy efficient lighting. This is just the beginning of some improvements our trustees have planned for this year. Don't forget to save the date for our next church visioning meeting via Zoom on August 9th. Stay tuned, there's more information to come. On Saturday, July 2nd at 8 a.m., we will be making sack lunches at the free store located inside Evangelical United Methodist Church at 345 Broadwater Avenue. Please sign up in the gathering area or talk to Louine. 
Grace UMC collected 1,704 diapers for the United Way and Family Promise. Special thanks to United Women in Faith, formerly known as the United Methodist Women, for their leadership in this project. Looking to spread the warmth of God's love to others? Join the Grace United Methodist Quilting Ministry. The group meets every Saturday at 9 a.m. in the quilting room in the hallway behind the fellowship hall. No quilting or sewing experience is necessary to be a part of this very special ministry. Dinner meals for a family at the Family Promise Day Center are needed on July 12th, July 14th, and July 15th. Sign up in the gathering area or talk to Loween for more details. Thank you all for helping create nine flood buckets last weekend. Our buckets will be taken to the UMCOR Depot located at Shiloh United Methodist Church. Currently, there are no buckets in storage at the depot as everything on hand was taken to the Livingston area. And now, let's take a look at some photos from the Jeep end of school year celebration. That's all for today. To find out more, please check out our Facebook page or visit our website at graceumcbillings.org. Thank you for being a part of Grace United Methodist Church. God, when you called each of us into being, you delighted in your works. You gifted us with differences that illuminate the breadth of beauty, wisdom, and practices of love in your creation. In whatever ways we still struggle to accept and celebrate our unique offerings, free us now from narrow thinking that confines, constrains, or condemns your good work in each of us. I invite you to stand if you're able and join in the call to worship. Jesus calls to the crowds with warnings. Jesus calls to the converts to follow him. Jesus calls to the resistors with parables of rejection. Jesus calls to you, proclaim the kingdom of God. And the people answer. Thanks be to God for life. We'll now join in hymn number 2052 in the Black Hymnal.
You may be seated. I invite our children to come forward. No way. Ah, yeah. Is that cool? All right, friends. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about the word wisdom. That means braveness. Braveness? Okay. Wisdom is being brave. What else do you think wisdom means? Mm-hmm. Being kind, okay, yeah. Asher, do you think you know what wisdom means? No? That's okay. It's kind of a, it's a bigger word, isn't it? Well, today we're going to be talking about how there's a lot of wisdom from the past. Right? Think about, can you think and tell me your earliest childhood memory? What's the first thing you ever remember? Yeah. Okay, going to the beach when you were a tiny, tiny baby, right? You remember that? Mm-hmm. Asher, do you, can you remember your first memory? Do you remember? To see your little brother? I don't know if he remembers that. <laughs> but you do, right? And so as, as Asher grows up, it's going to be really important that you tell him that story so that he knows. I whispered. He whispered it? Well, that's kind of how the Bible works sometimes. Stories are told from different people. And sometimes we think, ah, oh, I remember that just like yesterday. But what actually we remember is what other people told us about that day. Yeah, it happens. So we're going to kind of walk through some of the important things, and we're going to remember why it is. So I, I want to encourage you guys this week, when you're spending time with Grandma Shirley back there, to ask her stories. Like, what was it like when you were in school, Grandma? Or how did you meet Grandpa? Or what was it like when you had your first kid? Or ask her about her first kiss. <laughs> Could you imagine? But these stories are so important, and sometimes when we get separated from people, we don't get to hear their stories anymore. But it's stories, people's stories, that give us wisdom at the end of the day. All right? You pray with me? Dear Jesus, help us to remember to be wise. And to listen to you. Thank you so much for loving us. Amen. Awesome. Thank you guys. Appreciate you. Go remember some things. Go ask Grandma some awkward questions. <laughs> Let us sing Shalom to you. You may be, remain seated. Friends, we come to that time of our service where we greet one another. I don't have to give you instructions. You do this quite well on your own. <laughs> Let us greet one another in the name of Christ.
reading from the Holy Scriptures, starting in 2 Kings, the second chapter. Now, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way to Gilgal. Eliza, or, oh my gosh, it's going to be one of those. This is like Adam Hamilton all over again. <laughs> Eli said to Eli, stay here. For the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Then Eli said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Eli took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other, and the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Eli said to Eli, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Eli said, please, let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, you have asked a hard thing. Yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted to you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. He picked up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water. He said, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? Where is he? He struck the water again, and the water was parted to the one side and to the other. And Elisha crossed over. This is a prayer poem by Andre Lord. For those of us who live at the shoreline, standing upon the constant edges of decision, crucial and alone, for those of us who cannot indulge the passing dreams of choice, who love in doorways coming and going, in the hours between dawns, looking inward and outward, at once before and after, seeking a now that can breed futures like bread in our children's mouths. So their dreams will not be reflected in the death of ours. For those of us who were imprinted with fear, like a faint line in the center of our foreheads, learning to be afraid with our mother's milk, for, for, <clears throat> for by this weapon, this illusion of some safety to be found, the heavy-footed hope to silence us, for all of us, this instant and this triumph, we were never meant to survive, and when the sun rises, we are afraid it might not remain. When the sun sets, we're afraid it might not rise in the morning. When our stomachs are full, we are afraid of indigestion. When our stomachs are empty, we are afraid we may never eat again. When we are loved, we are afraid love will vanish. When we are alone, we're afraid love will never return. And when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard nor welcomed, but when we are silent, 
we are still afraid. So it is better to speak, remembering we were never meant to survive. Charlie horse is happening in my calves this morning. I don't know. If I, if I drop, we're okay. <laughs> Friends, uh, I want to thank you uh, for hosting Fellowship Time to celebrate my commissioning. And I'm going to take a little bit of the sermon time today to talk about that experience and, and what, um, what that means. Because I'm guessing many of you are confused about all these languages we use. It's, we call it methospeak, right? Um, it's a foreign language, and uh, it's important. Uh, so uh, the process uh, used to be that you would be ordained twice in the United Methodist Church. You would first be ordained as a deacon, and then uh, you would go on and become ordained as an elder later on. And what we found out in the history of our church is that we actually believe that deacons are an ordained elder called to a different type of ministry, right? To word and to service. And elders are called to the sacraments and the ordering of the life of the church. And so they're both seen as equally ordained um, colleagues. And so we had to come up with some way then to help pastors get through the their probationary period. And so we created commissioning um, as a provisional elder. And so pretty much what that means is that I'm on probation and the church doesn't like that language because it leads us to a justice issue of incarceration and none of us want to feel like we're on probation. Um, and so they created a whole new language around it to say provisional elder. And instead of being ordained an elder, you are commissioned as a provisional elder. Now, many of you know my story, right? I was supposed to be commissioned last year in Iowa and uh, didn't have that experience um, and had to safe harbor out to the, the west. And then we talked about a couple weeks ago that the Florida, the entire class got voted down uh, because we didn't want uh, any gay people getting through the process, right? And so I have to tell you, here I am in Helena. I love Helena. The last time I was in Helena was for Helena Pride last summer and I'm feeling safe I'm feeling good and right before they had us all lined up the, I just got so nervous I thought to myself like I'm not gonna actually see this happen but like what if it happens right maybe this is a door that will be shut again in front of me and so here we are lined up and they do the stupidest thing they make you walk in front of all of the clergy and you face them while somebody else reads your your bio. And everybody else in my class had written theirs in first person. So it was super awkward. Hi, my name's Jerry, coming out of somebody else's mouth. But I wrote mine in third person because I thought that's what they wanted. And so here I am. I'm the only one that did it that way. And I am standing in front of the entire clergy session, just shaking. We walk outside. They didn't have room for us in the church, so they put us on the patio under a tent, and we could hear everything that was being said inside the room, um, even though we were told not to listen. <laughs> and without any discussion, our whole commissioning class got voted in. And then we got to watch the ordinance come in and tell their call story and why they feel called to ordain ministry. And I sat there and I watched the beautiful diversity of call. Some people being chaplains that have been in the midst of it in the hospitals all the way through the pandemic, watching burnout and medical providers leave in large waves. And they're still there trying to minister to both the, the patients and to the staff. I saw others who planned to have bar church ministry as their full-time gig at one point in time. I, I saw one who said, church sucks. People are mean. I didn't want to become a pastor because all I had ever done is help run with my family, run the pastor out of town. 
And yet I'm here because God calls us. And then on Saturday morning last week, as we were in this beautiful ceremony with this beautiful music, I knelt down on that kneeling rail and I just began to weep uncontrollably knowing that I had finally gotten to this point still on probation, but I'm here. <laughs> and the bishop started to cry and she put her forehead right on mine. She's not supposed to touch my head. Only the ordinance heads get touched. We get laid on the shoulders and she has a firm grasp. <laughs> but we sat there and we weeped together and it was so profound. You all know that like, just because I'm gay and she's a lesbian doesn't mean we're best friends. But it was that moment of seeing the struggle that both of us had been through in this process and the way that we've tried to support one another and what this means for the future of our church as a whole as we, as a Mountain Sky Conference, continue to do the inclusive work of inviting all people. Later on in the conference, or early on in the conference, the legislation that I wrote passed with 94% that we would invite every single one of those candidates from Florida to the Mountain Sky Conference. Guess what? Several of them are WCA leaders in the Global Methodist Church, and they're welcome too. They don't want to come here, but they're welcome. <laughs> because that's what it means when we create an inclusive church. But in that moment where we talk about apathy, apostolic um, you know, succession, the idea that the disciples blessed others and throughout centuries we have asked certain people to respond to the call and to be commissioned for ministry, to be ordained for ministry. I felt that mantle placed upon me. I was telling some people, I called my mom, she sassed off to me and I said, watch it lady, you're talking to a holy man now. And in stereotypical fashion of my mother, well, then you better live up to it. <laughs> and it's true. You better live up to it. You see, we're talking about the mantle being passed down. And this week, one of the mantles that I felt was really important in our country was ripped away from many of you. And all of us. This work of preparing the next generation to care for for one another, to give people individual rights and choice over their body was ripped away. We know that in the coming months, there's going to be plenty of work to do. There are clergy in this area already gathering about how we'll set up a railroad, underground railroad, to get people to states they need. We're starting to raise money so that we can provide care for people who wouldn't get care within their state. We're doing what we can, and I will invite you to be part of that process but it reminds me of a seminary professor who used to say to us all the time that history doesn't repeat itself. The questions of history do, though. And when those questions arise, sometimes we come to different answers. Sometimes good and sometimes bad. History doesn't repeat itself, but the questions of history do. The questions of history do. I had originally planned to do a, a whole gay breakdown of how I think Eli and Eli were more than friends. Uh, there's a lot of evidence to that, but we're going to leave that alone today. Uh, happy Pride, everyone. I think what this scripture, though, and this relationship between Elijah and Elisha is really showing us how the work of preparing the next generation happens in the life of the church and in ministry as a whole. A blueprint that even Jesus will use as he calls his own disciples. It starts with inviting. Inviting people to consider to change their life. Elijah one day finds Elisha plowing a field and says, come with me. Leave everything and be one of my followers. God is calling you to a specific ministry. Come and follow me. Now, oftentimes, I think when we talk about inviting people, we think about how do we invite people in? How do we invite people to church, right? When is the last time, raise your hand if you've invited anybody to church in the last month. Oh, you guys are great. All right. How about the last three months? 
right? Last six months, right? This isn't anything wrong, right? What we're asking people to invite people into is a life of kindness, of mercy, and of justice, to be part of something much bigger than us, right? I hope that more hands go up when it's who invited somebody to go to the next rally at the courthouse. Because that's who God is calling us to be in this world today. A couple weeks ago, Mary, she's not here, so I'm going to say this, <laughs> said to me, Sam, you've got to stop telling people when you stand up for the offering that engagement is more important than participation. We need butts in the pews. I don't need butts in the pews. I need people like Carol Heath, who came and sponsored Queer Prom, blew up balloons until she was blue in the face, and then walked in the parade with us. I need people like Loeen, who comes and mows when it's 90 degrees and changes the sign to remind our neighbors that there were floods and people need us to respond. I need people to make sandwiches for people who wouldn't have a meal that day. I need people who care about young children and their development to give them safe space after school. We need people to care for our queer youth and our community to create a, a, a zoo, drag queen show. And every time I turned around, I saw another United Methodist. They're in support. That's the work that we are inviting people into. The rest of it will solve itself. But once they're there, we have to develop relationships with those people. And we have to develop their faith. It starts with study of the scripture or, or some type of study. It is fellowship and sharing meals. And it is worship that gels us together and reminds us why we do what we do. In this specific story, though, there's an added element of development called testing. It appears that this journey that they go on together makes no logical sense on a map. And many commentaries and theologians say that Elijah was testing Elisha. Will he continue to follow him even when it doesn't make sense, when he doesn't know what's going to happen? But each one of the spaces that they go to have significant parts of the history of the people. They first travel to Gilgal, a shrine that marks two uh, beginnings, the united Israel and the Christ crossing into the land of Yahweh, or that Yahweh promised to the people, and the inauguration of the Israelite monarchy. So Gilgal marks both the beginning of the promised land that was promised to the people and the beginning of the monarchy. Now remember that God never wanted a monarchy. People asked for it because they wanted to figure out how to rule the people, and God said, okay, we'll make this work. Because God evolves and works with us. Then they travel to Bethel, a royal sanctuary located the near, near the southern border of, northern, of the northern kingdom and is a symbol of the fractured kings. Right, so there's a lot of history with kings doing bad things. At this point, Elijah is re responding to uh, Jezebel and Ahab and different kings that have completely run amok. And he's trying to hold everything together. And then last, they go to Jericho. And Jericho brings together all of the conflict of the different families of the original tribes. It represents national unity and obedience to Yahweh. It is still a place where the people are fervent in their faith for Yahweh. But it also represents the arrogance of certain kings of the past who destroyed the whole city and rebuilt a new city right there. You see, Elijah is modeling for Elisha the different, through the different places what the prophetic ministry looks like. It looks like great times when God offers us the promised land, and it looks like Jericho that would be destroyed and rebuilt in honor of another God. It lays out the journey before for each of us in our prophetic ministries, because I feel each person is called to prophetic ministry. And then the Jordan River. Like Moses, Elijah strikes the water and the water parts. And to make it even more clear about the connection, it is told to us that they walked on dry ground. And Elisha, Elisha, 
He wants so much to have that same authority and spirit like his mentor. But then they part. They're walking down and a chariot shows up and poof! There are only two people in the Old Testament that don't die and get buried. Enoch and Elijah. But here's the thing that I think is important is that even anticipated separations are painful for those of us left behind. We're all going to die. I love the poem by Andrew Lord today, written to express what it feels like to be on the margins all the time, to live in constant fear. But the reminder is that none of us are meant to survive in this life. Elisha is also suspenseful, not knowing whether God will pass the mantle onto him. Imagine the nerves asking your mentor, give me double of what you have. A wisdom so great, a prophetic voice greater than yours. And note how Elijah never promises it. This is a great note to all mentors. Never promises it, but says if God wills it, it will happen. And then there's grief. We are called to grieve together. We know that grief can sometimes provide messiness. We're experiencing that in our home this week with the news of Adam's sister's cancer diagnosis. And at the same time, grief can provide clarity and purpose to any situation. Clarity and purpose. I was reminded of a great story of Pacini's last opera, The Turnando. Uh, if you know it, if you're big opera people, it's a beautiful piece. But Pacini actually died before he finished this opera piece. And as the story goes, right before he died, and he's, he's trying to finish as much of the opera as possible, he looks to his students and says, you all have to finish this after I'm gone. And they did just that. They studied all of the opera that was already there and tried to do honor and justice to their mentor and teacher. And when it premiered in Milan in 1926, as his favorite disciples stood up to direct the opera, they got right to the part where Pacini had died and stopped writing and the composer broke down in tears. The opera came to a halt, and from the pit, he says, thus far the master wrote, but he died. The entire room became silent as tears continued to fill each eye, and then from the pit again, but his disciples finished it. And they completed the opera. In this moment, Elisha doesn't really have much time to go grieve, but we know that even in the midst of everything flurrying around us, we grieve internally when things happen outside of our control. And then we have a special task within the church to confirm the gifts of each person. Elisha doesn't get his confirmation from Elijah, per se, as he's already ascended into heaven. But when he goes to strike the water the first time, The water doesn't part. The young prophet grows nervous, cries out again to the heavens, and then strikes the water with the mantle again. And indeed, the Spirit of God was upon him. When we do the work of church, we confirm the gifts of each person, their dedication, the work that they share with others. And we prayerfully ask people to respond to the way God is calling them. For some people, God may not be calling you to come and to sit in a pew on a Sunday morning. For some of you, in the next couple of weeks, you're going to decide how to get your rally cry on. And some of us will sit silent, watching things pass by. But we live true into our calling. Today in your bulletin, you found a card that looks kind of like an old school passport or postcard. And part of the journey that we're on in our church right now is remembering our past, asking questions that circle up every five, ten years in church. 
and dedicating to moving forward in a future that's very unclear. Our consultant uh, on Tuesday of last week shared with us that the work that we're doing is like building a plane that's already in the air. And at one point in the day, I thought, I just want a helicopter. I don't even want to build a plane right now. Can we build a helicopter instead? But the truth is, is that none of us know how to do church anymore in the same way that we were used to. But we do know that the way that we serve internally and externally makes a difference not only in our community and other spaces. And so I'm going to invite you to take that card and to fill it out as honestly as you possibly can. The little things you do here inside the church, the things that you serve outside of this community, the ways that you want to be connected in different ways. And I'm going to ask you to turn those in. Because one of the things that we're going to be doing as part of our visioning is seeing where our people are serving beyond our walls so that all of us can rally together. Because it makes no sense if seven of us do housing in different ways, but we don't even know that we do it, right? Or if everybody puts on there that they work in the food bank, but none of us work at the same food bank, why aren't we doing this work together? And so the missions team is going to take these cards, we're going to post them up and celebrate all the ways that we're serving in our community. The ways that we serve here, yes, be a little pretentious and give yourself a pat on the back as you're filling out the card. I do tech every week. I change the billboard. No one asked how it gets changed, but it happens. I come in and I vacuum on Saturday, making sure the toilets are clean. I'm always here to start coffee, even when no one asks. I play the violin because I want to enhance worship. Leanne puts up with the choir. (laughs) Glennis makes me rum cake. Friends, each of us serve the church in some way, little, big, small, it doesn't matter. It's all the same work of building the community. And so I invite you to fill that card out to be part of this process, but I want to end today with this wonderful story. When the drag queens showed up on Thursday (laughs) night, one of them overheard me telling the story that I promised my mother I would never do drag. And so Auntie Hex started laying the hammer on me and then realized I wasn't one of the kids. (laughs) I was the pastor. And so she just walked downstairs and avoided me the rest of the evening. (laughs) At the end of the night, I went up to her and I said, hey, we've been talking about doing a drag boot camp for the kids next year. Uh, And prom would be at the end of that so they can learn to do the makeup. They can have a choreographer come in and teach them to do some dance and work on costuming. And then we'll have the prom at the end of that week so those kids can can show off all of their work. Later on at the, at the prom, I was telling them that we had money in the budget uh, and would love to support the production company that connects all of the drag queens in the state of Montana. And he, she walked up and she put her arm around me and said, don't you dare send a penny of that money to us. Your job is to prepare the next generation to be the church that allows us to come and to perform in your basement. I don't want your money. I want you to do the work. Elisha's journey after this is going to get a little wild. Lose your mentor. You don't know. You know that you have the spirit of God upon you, but everything in society is always shifting and changing. The prophets teach us this all the time. But if we put in the work, we do the work, we remember the past, we tell our stories, We trust that the mantle of God is placed on each of us, the ministry of all believers. We truly can make a difference in our community and in our world. Thanks be to God. Amen. We pray now in Jesus' name for the church, the world, and all who are in need, saying, hear us, O God, 
your mercy is great. Holy God of healing and peace, we thank you for life and health, for morning and evening, for rain and sun, for all you give us to sustain life, and most of all for Jesus, who died and rose again to make real the promise of new life. We ask, O oh God, for a church that ministers every day to bring people together in your name, for hearts that will not judge, for minds that recognize injustice and oppression in all its forms, for hands that are open to answer your call. Merciful God, the nations you have called into being are many and full of marvels. We pray for their well-being, for leaders and workers, teachers and soldiers, scholars, artists, parents, and peacemakers, for nations and peoples in strife, especially for Ukraine and Russia, that your may, way may be known in all the lands and that joy may reign. Turn our hearts, Holy One, to respect and honor those who were not like us. Let us see in peoples of every nation the majesty of your desire for richness and difference. We ask your special blessing, O oh God, on the children in our communities, for their play and work in this summertime, to give them strength and renewal for an ever-increasing opening of their young minds, new ways of seeing, new understandings of the gifts you call them to use, and for their happiness and health. We lift up prayers for peoples whose names we know and for whose circumstances are close at hand. Are there names and situations we want to lift up as a community today? Yeah, Judy. Oh. So we pray for Becky, who has stage four ovarian cancer and uh, treatment not responding in the way we had hoped. Judy? Uh, for my mom, Nellie, uh, she fell and then discovered she fell in the and the moment that she recovered. Okay. For Judy's mom, Nellie, uh, who fell and had pneumonia and is recovering. Louie? We lift up Eric, uh, Jim and Diane's son, who is married this weekend, um, and for the joy of celebration and new life together as they begin the journey of marriage, um, and for photos that will be available in fellowship. Maureen? Uh, prayers for my cousin Joyce, who has a reoccurrence of cancer. Okay. Prayers for a cousin Joyce, uh, who has a reoccurrence of cancer. I specific, oh, yep, Pam. Her cousins, Jim and Kathy, who have very serious medical issues. Judy? Prayers for our Adam and his sister and for you. 
Yeah, uh, Adam's uh, sister was diagnosed with breast cancer this week. It's a very aggressive form of cancer. Um, we're still waiting on some more tests, but uh, as it sets now, uh, we're looking at 24 weeks of chemo and a double mastectomy. Um, and so it's a long journey. She's 35 and two little girls at home. Um, so just praying for her. Um, For the way our community gathered uh, yesterday at the Pride celebration, um, it was cute that organizers, there were protesters somewhere in the midst in the morning, and they said, do not engage, and here I am with the kids, like, oh gosh, because um, you never know what the kids are going to do. So for the amazing work of Sister Mary um, and Angela's Piazza um, and her retirement, it's like a priest, like what do you do when you retire? What do, what do nuns do? They go back to the nunnery? Um, choice. I want to lift up specifically the residents of Kyiv, um, where Russia launched attacks now into the capital city, into residential areas. Again, uh, for uh, women and healthcare providers across our nation, um, and the scary, scary, scary concurring uh, uh, decisions that came with that and uh, people's weight. Um, but we did have a celebration that gun legislation was finally passed um, and signed into the law. It may not be all we want, um, but it is at least a bipartisan effort showing our country can gather um, and make some change. I want to also lift up uh, a dear friend of mine who had a baby last week um, who has uh, come down with viral meningitis um, and is in the NICU. And so, uh, and mom had to have a post delivery operation for some complications. And so, just kind of a rough start um, to that. Uh, Jennifer is asking for continued prayers for her shoulder that is giving her lots of problems and for her, a brother-in-law Chris who's in transitional care um, from diabetes related kidney failure at St. John's um, asking that that transition uh, most likely to hospice is, is pain-free and comfortable. Into your hands God we place our prayers and all, all whose welfare we entrust to your care, bless them, and all who have needs only you can know. In thanksgiving for your gifts, we pray this in the name of God, mother of us all. And so now let us enter into a time of silence as we lift up the prayers that remain deep on our hearts. And so we pray the way Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Creator.
We thank you for the way that all of you can continue to support the church. A reminder to work on that card. If you can't do it all today, that's okay. Bring it back next week. Um, but we are just celebrating the way that our community responds to the needs of others all the time. And so let us uh, pray over the gifts and offerings and ourselves as we lay them at the altar. Gracious God, you give us your creation for our home and fill it with the necessities of life. You give us yourself as Jesus, our teacher, friend, and savior, whose life, death, and resurrection and ascension show us daily your love for your people. You give us your Holy Spirit, who fills our hearts with prayer and by whose light we hear your word. Bless these gifts and make us truly thankful. All glory and honor is yours, now and forever. Amen. Let us sing uh, our closing hymn, not the benediction hymn, but the closing hymn, uh, Our God, O oh God, Our Help in Ages Past. Live in hope, love with mercy, leave no stone unturned in your calling as one of God's precious disciples. For as often as you heed the word of the Lord, you are turned toward what is good and beautiful. Receive now this blessing in the name of the Creator, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.